in the eighth year after Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ told his companions in Medina to prepare themselves to go out for battle. In this battle, particularly, no one knew the plans of the Prophet ﷺ, including his own wife and his closest companions like Abu Bakr al-Anhu. Until the day was decided, the day before they set out, the Prophet ﷺ told them, we are going to Mecca. Now, why would he go to Mecca? There was a treaty in place between the Quraysh and the Muslims, known as the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. But what happened was, one of the tribes allied with the Quraysh. They went to the Quraysh and said, we want to attack this tribe allied to the Muslims. Both live on the outskirts of Mecca. And the Quraysh gave their approval, anticipating that it'll be a raid at night, stealing some camels and horses and the like and whatnot. Nothing too intense, no loss of life. No one will know, just a typical raid that happens. And so, Banu Bakr, the tribe allied of Quraysh, goes ahead and attacks Banu Khuza'a. But when they did so, it didn't go as planned. The women and the children were alerted, people woke up, and then they defended themselves. And what ended up happening is over 20, including women and children, were killed from Banu Khuza'a. And it was a break of the treaty. Even one of Banu Khuza'a escaped and fled into Mecca and went into the boundaries of the Haram. And within the Haram, you cannot be attacked. It's a sanctified place. Yet he was killed within the boundaries of the Haram, which is a big no-no. So a massive mistake upon a massive mistake, and news reaches the Prophet ﷺ after their leader comes to him with 40 from his tribe, and they recite lines of poetry explaining what happened and how their tribe was attacked in the night and they were killed while they were praying and the like. And so the Messenger of Allah ﷺ finally, after some time passed, the news was announced that we're going to Mecca. And an army of 10,000 is gathered and they head out to Mecca in the month of Ramadan and they reach there in nine days. Now when they camped outside Mecca, news has reached Mecca that perhaps an army is coming. They don't know who and they're not sure what exactly the details are. Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, who just embraced Islam actually went into Mecca and he meets Abu Sufyan and Abu Sufyan is now the leader of Quraysh. He is brought to the Prophet ﷺ. And after some back and forth and some conversations between the two, Abu Sufyan, finally after decades of opposing the Prophet ﷺ, leading Uhud, leading Ahzab, being the leader of the enemies against the Prophet, now embraces Islam. And so Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, who also just embraced Islam, he tells the Messenger of Allah, give him something. Abu Sufyan is a leader. So the Prophet ﷺ tells him, and look at subhanAllah, the mercy of the Messenger of Allah, despite him being the leader of his opposition to him for so long, he says, anyone who comes into your house, will be safe. But he first said, once we attack, anyone within the Haram boundaries is safe. And anyone who stays in their own home, meaning they don't come out to fight, they will be safe. But he also gave him a special recognition, said anyone who comes to your house will also be safe. But Abu Sufyan goes into Mecca and he sees this army of the Muslims, the shining armor and the fires that are lit, this massive 10,000 strong. And he goes into Mecca and he tells the people, you have no chance. So whoever comes to my house is safe. And he conveniently leaves out the other two because he wants to feel special. Somebody tells him, how can we all fit inside your house? And he says, okay, if you go to the Haram, you're safe. Or if you stay in your house, you're safe. And so the next day comes, and the Prophet Sallallahu he divides the army into three and one comes in from the east, one comes in from the west and he Sallallahu Alaihi from the middle, they enter into Mecca. And for the most part, the people of Quraysh knew that there was nothing they can do and they stayed within their homes. A few tried to fight back and were handled. And the Prophet Sallallahu gave very clear instructions, do not kill anyone, do not hurt anyone unless you are forced to do so. An army coming in after eight years of battle and prior to the eight years, 13 years of difficulty and torture and abuse and neglect and abductions and being driven out of their homes, all all of that. And the Messenger of Allah said, now catching them by surprise, says, do not harm anyone. And so he comes into Mecca. He was wearing a red turban Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his head was lowered. The narrations say that his beard was almost touching the hump of the camel he was riding. Humble. And the first thing he does is he goes to the Kaaba and he begins performing tawaf on his camel around the house of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And he takes his stick and he points to the idols and he says, Truth has been established and the falsehood has vanished. For indeed falsehood is something that will not last. And with each time he's pointing to the idols the idols are coming down and there are over 300 idols around the Kaaba. And the Quraysh, the people of Mecca, they know if you're within the Haram, you're safe. And so people start coming into the Haram and witnessing what they're seeing. The Messenger of Allah, the one who they knew as a Saliq al Amin, the truthful and the trustworthy, the one who they would turn to when they had issues, disputes amongst themselves, the one who his own enemies would know that they'll get their trust back. Even when he made Hijrah, he left Ali in his bed to give them the trust back. They're seeing him with their own eyes now. Many of them fought him on the battlefield and now they're seeing him going 
around the Kaaba, knocking down the idols. And then once he did so, he went inside the Kaaba and he purified the Kaaba as well from the idols. And then he comes out and now the Haram is full. Everybody's there. And he comes outside of the door of the Kaaba and he addresses the thousands who are now waiting and listening and he says, La ilaha illallah wahda, sadaqa wa'da, wa nasara abda, wa hazam al ahzab wahda, la ilaha illallah. There is absolutely no one worthy of worship but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is one. He fulfilled his promise. He gave victory to his slave and he defeated the Confederates. There is no God worthy of worship but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says, Every matter of jahiliyyah is abolished except for two sadana and siqaya. Sadana is those who will bear the keys of the Kaaba, stayed in Bani Abdul Dar, and siqaya and providing water to the pilgrims who come for Hajj. Those are two practices that will stay. Everything else has been abolished. And then he goes on to say, and all the arrogance of jahiliyyah has been abolished, meaning the tribalism and the ties based on tribe and not on brotherhood. He says, all of you are from Adam and Adam is from dust. Then he recited the verse in Surah Hujurat, Ya ayyuhan nas, inna khalaqanakum min dhakari wa untha, wa ja'alnakum shu'uba wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu. O mankind, we indeed have created you from a male and a female and made you into different nations and tribes so that you may get to know one another. Inna akramakum indallahi atqakum, inna allaha alimun khabir. Indeed, the most honor of you is those who has the most taqwa. And indeed, Allah is all knowing, all aware. And then he says, O oh people of Quraysh, this is the moment. Their fate now is in the hands of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The man they opposed for so long and they thought they would be victorious over. They are now humbled and awaiting the decision what will happen to them. So he says, what do you think I will do to you? And so if you were giving a fair answer, you would say, you're going to execute all of us for that's what they deserve. But they say, we think you will do good. You are a generous man, our brother and the son of a generous brother. And so the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says in the famous statement, go, you are free. And he says a statement that Yusuf السلام, said to his brothers, There is no blame upon you today. How merciful. He then goes to the mountain of Safa. And then the people of Mecca realize many of them had been waiting. What will happen? Who will win? If the Prophet wins, السلام, that means he's a prophet. But if he loses, he wasn't a prophet. And so they're waiting to see which way the political strength will fall and then they will embrace. And so people came in groups upon groups and embracing Islam one after another. And so when we attain success, when we have moments of happiness, the day of our marriage, the day of Eid, how do we celebrate Eid? We gather in the masjid and we recite takbirat. We make dhikr of Allah, we praise Allah. But if we fall into the same trap that our society around us has fallen into, of celebrating success with sin, then we have failed. How do people celebrate? By sinning. How do we celebrate? On our wedding day, do we throw out the norms of Islam has taught us? We throw out the dress code and we throw out the interactions and we throw out the, it's just one day. But then the picture live on and maybe on social media and the like. How do we celebrate our days of Eid? How do we celebrate private successes in our lives when we're promoted in a job or we get into medical school or we get into whatever we're looking to? Do we humble ourselves and do we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do we acknowledge وَمَا تَوْفِيقِي إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ That everything I have is from Allah and whatever I've been given is from Allah. It's not from your efforts. Your effort played a role but as Allah who gives, you may have studied less than your friend or your classmate. But the rizq of Allah is as He decides. Allah says in Surah Hadid, Whatever befalls you, whether it's good or bad, know that's from Allah. So you don't become too sad if you miss something that you were searching so much for, nor become too happy when you get something that you are given. You keep level-headed, always keep humble, always praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and acknowledge that success only comes from Allah. We ask Allah for tawfiq.